Taylor, uh, wonderful to be back on your show. It's it's nice to uh, talk about things that we have been developing for the last what year or so since uh, we last spoke. Uh, during this time, uh, there was some uh, significant there was some significant development into this uh, solar sales, and those developments relate to uh, the fact that now we have uh, uh, sale materials developed, uh, very uh, very good materials that uh, we that we can take our sales and bring them very close to the sun. Quarter of an AU will be a safe distance, so that's uh, pretty close to the sun. And so, if we bring our sail craft to that distance, uh, we will be able to reach velocities pretty much twice the Voyager speed. Voyager moves now. Voyager one moves with velocity of roughly 3.1 astronomical units per year. So we can uh, actually fly twice that. And so that will be a record holding uh, experience for everybody. So we are developing something we call technology demonstration mission. And that technology demonstration mission, um, uh, we are now fundraising. So essentially we need to bring the funding uh, the total funding required for that mission, it's about $20 million. So that mission will go all the way uh, using uh, using the uh, ride share capabilities. We'll, we'll be flying uh, with Falcon 9, reaching uh, a low Earth orbit, and maybe uh, have a little booster to kick us to maybe Geo. And then from that, uh, from that point, we will open sails, and in about seven months, we'll be going by the sun, reaching perihelion. And so... Uh, once we do that, uh, reach and perihelion flying by the sun, then we open the sails. And in this case, um, within, uh, let's say, within about a year from launch, our vehicle will be going twice the Voyager speed. It will be zooming by Earth, getting probably to Mars, uh, to that distance. And so the objective for that technology demonstration mission will be, first of all, to demonstrate that we can... Look, every boat uh, wants to go out of a harbor. So we have been flying solar sails around on, on Earth orbit. So there was uh, interesting demonstrations around Earth. And the latest one was a uh, light sail demonstration by the Planetary Society. It was recently deorbited. Successful mission. Then Japanese took the solar sail mission all the way to Venus. And so essentially, we want to go much closer to the sun because this is where the strongest... Uh, strongest uh, propellant tank exists. <laughs> what I mean by propellant tank is that solar, uh, solar radiation pressure will be much uh, higher uh, when we get close to the sun. This okay. is where we can actually get a lot of uh, uh, pressure on the sailcraft will reach the highest velocity. So instead of a gravitational assist, it's kind of a sunlight pressure photon um, pressure assist almost? It's, yeah. a, it's, it's, it's a combination. You can call it a gravitational assist, but actually, it's an assist now by, in addition to gravity assist, it actually will be accelerated assist with the solar radiation pressure. It's like uh, there is something called Oberth maneuver. Oberth maneuver when you go by uh, 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 nearby, if you if you're flying by a massive body, like let's say by Jupiter or near the Sun, and uh, during the closest approach, if you work with uh, with you a solid rocket booster, so you will actually as you move in rather rapidly. Uh, nearby the uh, so, uh, sort of gravitating body and at the perihelion if you uh, start working with your uh, rocket uh, solid rocket motor you will reach much higher velocity in our case we'll be using orbit maneuver essentially quote unquote uh solar radiation pressure not chemical propulsion but solar radiation pressure and in this case spacecraft our sailcraft will be moving very fast going by the sun and then once it's uh, passing by the sun will be able to reach that high velocity so that is the, the technology demonstration mission that mission will have cameras will have some small instruments the objective for that mission will be first of all to demonstrate that the sail craft can reach that proximity to the sun it will show that it will be navigable so that we can actually uh we will be able to navigate it like a normal spacecraft it's a uh, solar radiation pressure allows us uh, give us a little bit low thrust capability we don't have a significant you know propulsion capability like you work with chemical propulsion or sort of the uh, uh, other other effective ways of uh, propulsion but once you reach the solar uh, the, the solar proximity this is where you will be tapping into sort of infinite reservoir with the propellant quote unquote and re really reaching the velocities that you cannot reach otherwise mm -hmm. so this is a very effective way uh, to fly vehicles, not only to Mars, as I mentioned, but also, also going much further. So that will open up a very nice path for us to explore solar system. 
look, once we will demonstrate that our sailcraft can be navigable, will reach their destination. For example, we can pass by an asteroid, we can take pictures of an asteroid in the main belt, mm -hmm. or we can pass by Earth and Moon system. We will show that this uh, sailcraft essentially can be navigated as a normal spacecraft. With that, now we can think about uh, other missions. And so other missions, the first mission that comes to mind uh, where the science will be done with the using solar sails would be orbiting the sun, uh, forming a polar orbit around the sun, not equatorial, but really forming the polar orbit around the sun. And so then you will be looking at the uh, solar poles, like uh, so southern and northern pole of yeah. the sun. And if you remember, uh, remember when Cassini mission was flying by Saturn, and when we uh, were looking at the North Pole of Saturn, we realized that there is some hexagonal structure in the Saturnian atmosphere. And the similarly interesting geometrical structure exists all, also on uh, uh, northern uh, and on the poles of Jupiter. So because it's uh, you know a Galileo spacecraft when it was flying by uh, by Jupiter, so also saw very interesting structure on the poles of uh, it's that structure formed by the density of uh, atmosphere and essentially because the planet rotates, so essentially the mixing of the density of the dense uh, atmosphere forms a very interesting structure in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and so in the polar region. Uh, we think that some will have the same structure, similar structures, maybe hexagonal structure on its poles, but no, nobody had seen it. And so that will be amazing, uh, um, uh, amazing way for us to learn about the sun, about solar activity, about how sun operates. And for using solar sails would be a unique way to address that uh, possibility because most of the missions we have flown, we have flown in the past, they all constrained to the solar system ecliptic plane. You launch from the Earth orbit, and so Earth orbits the sun, pretty much still within the equatorial plane, and getting outside the equatorial plane will be very energetically uh, expensive. In a sense, you would need to go to Jupiter with chemical propulsion, then flying by Jupiter, and you can reach or orbit kind of almost perpendicular to the ecliptic, as uh, a European uh, spacecraft called Ulysses uh, was able to achieve. <clears throat> but it's not enough. We need to orbit around the sun in very close proximity. And so that uh, solar sailing capability will allow us to move around the sun and cranking the inclination with about three degrees every 28 days. We'll be orbiting the sun at about 0.4 AU initially. And then every 28 days, our inclination of orbit will be uh, raised by three degrees. And within a year, we will be moving polar, uh, totally polar. And so heliophysicists would love to have mission like that. And if it, will, if it will fly not one, but maybe four spacecraft around the sun in a, a polar orbit, then we will be able to monitor solar activity constantly. So permanently, some of the spacecraft will be looking in either North or South Pole, and we'll be able to study the space weather and study the solar activity and really learn more about the sun, what our neighboring star has uh, sort of has in, in its own you know, interior. So that will be another mission that we will be an uh, interesting mission that we would like to fly. Right. Next mission would be something maybe go all the way to Enceladus. Yeah. Enceladus because look, look, uh, getting to Enceladus, why Enceladus? I think Enceladus is my favorite uh, moon of uh, uh, no, um, of um, uh, planets in the solar system. Why? Because Cassini spacecraft, when, when it was flying in uh, in uh, a Saturnian system, was able to de to, to 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 detect the presence of ice on the surface of Enceladus. There is ocean on Enceladus, very thick layer of ocean, and then very thick layer of ice. And so we also saw images of geysers streaming from the south pole of Enceladus as we speak. Now there is activity, that means there is warm ocean on, on the surface of on, on Enceladus. And if there is warm ocean, uh, then uh, that means there may be some life in right. the uh, in Enceladus's ocean, maybe some bacteria, maybe some, maybe even, you know, uh, some of some, uh, uh, <laughs> some some other organisms would be wonderful to have confirmation that life exists there yeah. and uh, but to get there it very very it takes a long a long time so we're talking about nine astronomical units right and so getting there uh currently i think nasa has plans to uh start thinking about the mission to enceladus by 2045 and if we start thinking we'll probably fly that mission by 2060 and that means it will go there, it will do some uh, amazing uh, uh, science. But why don't we do some precursor science? Why don't we do something earlier? 
yeah. with soft sales. And then the data that we will be able to collect will inform the development of that flagship mission that NASA will fly at some point later. Right. So these are the missions that we are thinking, and uh, we. But first of all, to get there, we need to essentially to fly our technology demonstration mission that we are planning to do in the next uh, two years. Is that phase three or four that you're in? Um, that is uh, our NAYAK phase three uh, finished in uh, 2022 in September. Okay. So now we are doing uh, this with volunteers, with a team of volunteers, and we are fundraising from uh, multiple uh, sources. Uh, yep. First of all, we approach uh, NASA for that for, for that funding, yep. and also we are bringing money from private in, uh, private uh, individuals uh -huh. who, are, who are interested to support that. Yep. So uh, stay tuned, and maybe in uh, in six months from now, I will be able to report that we have full of uh, we've been, we we will have fully full uh, full funding that is needed for to fly that mission. Yeah, at demonstration. Okay. And look, a good example of what we're trying to achieve when we tried to fly helicopters on Mars. Initially, nobody trusted us. Nobody believed the helicopter can fly. Come on, they said, no, no, no. The technology is too risky. We will not be funding that. Mm -hmm. So JPL decided to fund it on its own. And essentially, it's out of internal money. So we essentially spend money to develop a helicopter. And now, as you're aware, helicopter on Mars, uh, in sort of ingenuity, had flown 70 times on Mars. 70 times autonomous flight in a rotorcraft on a different on in an atmosphere of different planet. Now, when we think about a Mars sample return, we now think only in terms of helicopters are flying on Mars, collecting the samples from uh, from Perseverance and essentially bringing uh, bringing them back on the sort of Mars ascent vehicle and bring the samples back. So that means initially that idea of flying uh, a helicopter in uh, atmosphere of mars was uh, considered very challenging very ambitious now it became mainstream we want to do the same with solar sails because once we demonstrate the capability then people will say oh why why don't you fly solar sails as a precursor as a ranger just get in there to get first initial uh, sort of reconnaissance and then it will pave the road for larger spacecraft that will be orbiting landing and developing something even more spectacular but those uh sort of the scout missions may be done with the solar sail capabilities so that's something that we would like to do and um honestly look if um if you remember uh there were only seven spacecraft that went beyond the orbit of jupiter so to Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Cassini, New Horizons. So you, you basically can name all of those spacecraft. But it took us, what, 40 years? And we had only six, six spacecraft uh, reaching that distance. And uh, those spacecraft discovered so many interesting uh, targets for us to observe, looking for Planet 9, looking for uh you know flying going back to you know to pluto system studying neptune study studying uranus would yeah. be wonderful so but solar system is large if we will be studying solar system with cadence of six spacecraft every 40 years it's right. just enough we need to fly faster right and basically so you're you're mentioning seven astronomical units a year is what we can get um, oh, we can get faster but uh, with, with the tdm technology demonstration which mission we are aiming at anywhere between five to seven and when you correlate that with a graph of price to get that, it's and you compare that to chemical means, it's much, much, much cheaper. And so that's kind of the case. Absolutely. Look, the spacecraft we are talking about, it's about um, uh, 70 kilograms uh, mass. And so the cost of that mission, even for, for, for the TDM, it will be much lighter. It will be on a scale for about 20 to 25 kilos. The, uh, the, the cost of that mission is 20 million, two zero, not, not 200, not 2 billion dollars that we used to hear. Right. So it's a very different economics. Now yeah. universities can fly missions like that. Once technology is proven and demonstrated in flight, then yeah. basically university can raise that much money and fly things. Yeah. And so that will be amazing for us to, to start doing it. Yeah, those are the two variables that I look at. I break it down into space travel in what amount of dollars. Uh, and those two things, are, I think, are key and the only thing you really need to focus on. And light sales, to me, seems the cheapest in um, per foot, if you will, or put. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, um, that's, that's very promising. You're absolutely correct. There is another variable. There is another variable. It's time. Time is also important. Look, uh, 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 consider a, a new PhD, uh, a person, uh, she just defended her PhD this year. 
and uh, she is joining the science team somewhere in academic organization, maybe within NASA, maybe uh, with the university, somewhere. And then her team will start writing proposals to NASA to sort of develop a mission to study Enceladus or, right. you know, Europa or, you know, any other moons of any other sort of planets. And mm -hmm. maybe on the third try, in a, within about 10 years, uh, they, this team will get successful. And so once they will start developing the mission, by the age of 50, mm. she will see her spacecraft on a launch pad somewhere on the Cape Canaveral. Yeah. So it's not a very exciting area for young scientists to get in because it takes enormous amount of time for them for their career. It's yeah. only the, they will have their full career devoted to one and a half missions. Maybe one and will develop yeah. something else. Cassini mission. We need to the, whole that. the whole team for the Cassini mission, That's that, that was their whole career, it was Cassini. Exactly. We need to change that. So you're right. The cost is a critical variable. The capabilities, the, the, the speed and the time that we bring in. So now we will be able to democratize it sort of. It will be the access to solar system will be democratized. So we, we can actually fly missions. There may be some even commercial uh, opportunities for companies to start doing something like this. So think about the company will start developing solar sailing missions and will fly them to provide data and NASA and other agencies may be in the business of buying the data, not developing the capabilities, but basically they just need to get the data. They will put a price tag for the data around the sun, for example, with this cadence, with this resolution, and uh, some companies will be will be able to deliver that. It changes the business model, how we develop uh, the sort of the deep, space, uh, deep solar system uh, yeah. exploration. NASA gets the thing that it cares about, which is the information and it outsources the building and the innovation of the technology to other to other companies absolutely and sharing the risks is another uh, sort of uh, very good approach because nasa doesn't need to develop all the technologies in-house nasa right. can buy services nasa can partner with companies that have those capabilities and that will be much better to energize the science community the exploration community the commercial community the sort of the space industry that's the way to actually operate it you don't have to do everything for yourself just share the risks and those commercial companies may contribute some some funding that they have it will be less expensive for the for the public and that's something very important and how how close are you working with elon's team um, um, we are working with them in terms of the launch capabilities, so we'll be launched on uh, Falcon 9. Yeah. But once we demonstrate that, I do expect that there will be some interest from uh, from them to actually go further. Their interest now is actually to fly Starship, of course, so to have uh, reliable operations of, of Falcon 9 and Dragon going all the way to the space station. So then, then operating uh, Starlink for communication capabilities and developing Starship. So this team is pretty busy. Uh, us bringing additional capability, I think at some point they will be interested as well. But now they are very sympathetic with our uh, sort of with, with our efforts. Uh, but we didn't approach them uh, uh, for, uh, yet to join the team and sort of start working on this together. We will once we demonstrate the capabilities and whatever, when, when things will be uh, more sort of certain as to when we fly. Great. And I'm assuming you're working with the Planetary Society as well. Absolutely. And the Planetary Society, look, we were uh, partnering with them essentially uh, when they were flying their uh, light sail mission. And mm -hmm. the people who build this space, uh, sail craft are very much uh, uh, interested working with us. And when we developed our technology demonstration mission, those, mm -hmm. mission, those people were contributing to the design. We're talking about uh, Darren Garber, we're talking about uh, uh, Thomas Svitek, uh, people who actually uh, Thomas built a lot of interest in hardware and actually demonstrated a lot of interesting in technologies in space. So is Darren Garber and Louis Friedman, uh, who used to be executive director for Planetary Society. He is a very prominent member of our team on the Solar Gravitational Lens Focus mission and the developing solar sailing capability capabilities. So Louis is very very much interested to see those missions uh, flying sooner rather than later. And um... What exactly is the capacity of their team? So do they basically outsource their talent in the building, in the engineering capacity to, to NASA? Is that the kind of relationship? Are you talking about planetary, yeah. planetary, society? planetary society? With the planetary society, the arrangement was different. So they actually work with private industry. Gotcha. They were able to get uh, funding from, uh, from, from members. 
uh, because it's a member-driven uh, sort of uh, society. It's a large membership. I think it's the largest uh, space-oriented society uh, sort of in on, on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so members were able to fund their missions, mm -hmm. and but then they developed those uh, spacecraft uh, 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 working uh, together with uh, a private industry. And that's how, how they were able to constrain the costs and deliver on schedule and yep. taking some, some risks. So they were able to do this. They have flown successfully. And so now we uh, are interested to make the next step, taking that sailcraft, which we have designed during our NIAC phase three to the solar proximity, and then making the biggest step for the solar sailing to show that we can actually fly things. At a very mm -hmm. Are we able to test this in a vacuum on Earth with um, artificial light, or do we, does it have to be a true test, scientific test in space itself? We can um, look. The photo effect was uh, proven uh, back in the late 19th century. Peter Lebedev, uh, a Russian scientist, who had demonstrated that in, in, ex indeed there is a solar radiation pressure exists or a light light pressure. You use Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, and there is some sort of the light pressure is just coming out naturally of, of, from that. And so, yes, indeed, now we have. Uh, uh, not only did we confirm this in laboratory, so we have we, we, we knew about this effect for so many years, for almost a couple of what is a century and a half. And so we have flown those uh, sailcraft in Earth orbit, so we know that it exists. In our case, so um, uh, in our case, uh, to demonstrate the uh, sort of navigational capability of that sailcraft, we will be building uh, uh, sort of scaled prototypes. And so we'll be putting those prototypes in a vacuum chamber, just basically testing the pre-flight. Right. But really, but really, I don't think there is any any doubt that sort of uh, the the material that we selected for the solar for, for the for the sale will yeah. work this plant. It's basically it's a, it's a there is no technology development is needed for our for our TDM because all of the technology exists. We just need to put it together right. and actually fly to the sun. Right. And um, let's get into the physics and the, the material a little bit. So the material itself is very, very thin. What exactly is that made of? Well, it's um, in this case, it's cap it's a my uh, it's a aluminized capton. It's only uh, three or four microns thick, and so that's uh, it's aluminized. It's a highly reflective material, and so that is something that already exists. You can just go and buy this material. So there is a, there are some companies that actually make this happen. For the next step. Uh, that uh, materials that we develop now at UCLA in the uh, group of Professor uh, Arthur Davoyan and also in at Caltech and the group of uh, Professor Harry Atwater. So those materials will be very reflective. So in case of uh, a group in UCLA, they develop materials that will be able to reach very close proximity to the sun, will be highly reflective. So we're talking about re reaching velocities uh, probably uh, on a scale of about uh, 20 to 30 astronomical units per year. And mm -hmm. so this uh, will, will be required. For, to, to do that, you need to come very close to the sun at, let's say, 0.1 AU from the sun. That is something um, it's challenging with technology that we have today. But the technology development that, that is ongoing, uh, I expect within about three to five years, those materials will exist. And then the, in a the group of Harry Atwater, so Harry Atwater and his, uh, his colleagues are working on something called laser sails. Laser sails, uh, we, are, uh, we are on the team of uh, Breakthrough Starshot. So Breakthrough Starshot is uh, the uh, project that is funded by um, a, a group of uh, uh, individuals, uh, Yuri Milner and uh, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, uh, it used to be uh, when Stephen Hawking was part of that project as well, as well late, late Stephen Hawking. The idea is to send a sail, uh, sort of a laser driven uh, sail craft that will reach velocities of roughly 20% uh, of speed of light, reach an Alpha Centauri in about 20 years. Yeah. But for that, uh, you need to have a very strong, very powerful laser. Right. So that laser will be shine on four meter uh, sail. Sail material must be able to sustain that uh, energy. And is so very different materials are developed for that. Is the laser fixed somewhere or is the laser following the craft behind it in the same... Um you can um, you can position that uh, photon engine we call it uh, on the ground on Earth, for example, somewhere on the southern, southern hemisphere, because we will be flying towards Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is a southern star, so we need to get uh, positioning somewhere in Chile uh, would be a good way to uh, sort of to to position that photon engine. 
but ultimately it would be nice maybe, maybe position it in, in space so that basically because photon engine is rather powerful uh powerful machine so right. we need to make sure that we'll get approval before we shine that laser because there's some spacecraft will not be happy if we'll hit the, the spacecraft right right so, so we need to make sure we, we, we need to make sure that there will be no interaction with the sail car, with the spacecraft in orbit. So that is something we are aware, and we develop a, a, a sort of protocols so yeah. that we will not be able uh, to shine any any type of uh, signal, unwanted signal, on any spacecraft. So, Got but it. at this moment, technology pretty much uh, we know what technology is needed. So we know how to build this type of vehicles. But still, there is a lot of work to do. We need to build the materials. We need to develop coherently combined uh, a set of lasers so that we'll be able to, uh, so that those lasers will actually um, uh, combine uh, to reach a very, very high power which is needed to propel that sailcraft. Okay, I'm just trying to visualize it. Is the laser sitting on Earth, which then gets the craft out of the atmosphere and into low Earth orbit maybe or something, and then the moon has a laser that pushes it further and then it's kind of like jockeying between lasers or is it from Earth all the way to where we want it? Um, let's assume that we have um, a photon engine on the ground on Earth. So for that, it's only it's not it's not just one laser. You need to combine pretty much a thousand uh, one kilowatt lasers. So we're talking about gigawatt laser uh, when when it's combined gigawatt power. Right. And so uh, you launch a, a set of spacecraft in uh, in, a, in a carrier somewhere in low Earth orbit. And so at a very uh, appropriate moment those uh, uh, sailcraft will be released uh, from the vehicle and they will be positioned in, in Earth orbit. Uh, when there will be perfect alignment, that photon engine will, will shine the laser through the atmosphere. And when that uh, laser light will reach that uh, four by four meter spacecraft, um, I'm sorry, it's, yeah, uh, it's a small spacecraft, a sailcraft. Mm -hmm. And by that time, it will just kick that spacecraft, will shine that, pow that powerful laser for about four minutes. And within four minutes, spacecraft will be able uh, to reach orbit of uh, Mars. And uh, by that time, I think it will be moving with uh, about 20% uh, of speed of light. So no need to shine laser from uh, from the moon. It's only you keep um, Earth rotates, Earth moves around its orbit. When you need to adjust the beam when you propagate the beam through atmosphere, when it reaches the sailcraft, it needs to keep pointing towards the sailcraft and keep uh, supporting it following that uh, space uh, sailcraft until it reaches the uh, velocity you want so there are lots of details details i'm skipping but the basics of operations you need you have a photon engine it may be positioned either on the ground or maybe on the moon yeah uh, on the moon will be a little bit more expensive because you need to launch there you need to build construction wise will be more expensive it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more economical to do this from from earth right and then once you have that built then basically building those set of uh, sailcraft you, we will be bunching, we will be flying a bunch of those uh, small uh, laser uh, driven sails, let's say maybe 100 of those sails. And basically, once they reach appropriate alignment, the laser will shine and the sailcraft will start moving. That's that's the idea. Gotcha. And Perfect. so, the point, um, uh, this, uh, Taylor, uh, of, of what I'm trying to say is that there is a, a whole range of technologies. First of all, we start with moving around the sun, demonstrating uh, sort of technology. Um, uh, needed to fly uh, solar sails in the solar system. We need to. We don't need to move with very high velocity. Right. Anywhere between five to ten AU a year will be sufficient to move within the solar system. Yep. Then uh, next step would be to reach a solar gravitational lens, as we discussed in the past. For that, for that uh, objective, we need to move with velocities anywhere between 20 to 25 AU per year. And yep. so for that technology is being developed now. So we hope to be able to start flying towards the solar gravitational lens mission by the mid of next decade. And at the same time, we develop a similar technologies, but uh, now they're aiming at the laser driven sails. So laser driven sails will have different objectives. They need to be able to move fast and they need to be able uh, to reach sort of uh, Alpha Centauri in the re sort of in a reasonable time frame within the lifetime of the present generation. Yeah. And so that's how we scale the technology. There is a lot of synergy, but as you see, there are different objectives, but the team pretty much, now we have a very diverse team that works on the sales, different varieties of sales, spacecraft structure, communication algorithms, uh, payload structure, science instruments, uh, sail driven, uh, so solar sails and light sails, sort of laser sails, very different, but the group is very interesting, very dynamic. 
Okay, so if, if um, hypothetically we're able to get the solar-driven sails out, how far can those go out? I'm assuming there's a radius that we have to keep in mind and then it's ineffective. Uh, for this uh, solar sailing um, capability, for the solar-driven sails, we are uh, using those sails to reach uh, distances of roughly uh, 900 astronomical units. When we study the solar gravitational lens, so with the solar gravitational lens, if we are uh, moving with velocity of roughly 25 to 30 AU per year, we can reach the solar gravitational lens focal region, which is about okay. 550 to 650 astronomical units Good. within about 20 years. And then we'll have a 10, uh, 10 years mission uh, science uh, science phase duration. But mm -hmm. by, the time, by, the, uh, by the by by the time we finish uh, that science phase, so our sailcraft will be at the distance of roughly 900 AU. And so that's the... Uh, first step the humanity will make outside the solar system, essentially. Uh, yeah. uh, after Voyager, Voyager made that step. So Voyager yeah. is officially moving outside the solar system, but we will have a mission designed to do just that, studying different exoplanets, different different uh, life-bearing planets in, the, in the, our galaxy. But right. for that, we need to use solar gravitational lens. Is the, is the speed of, is the velocity of the craft with the solar sail constant? Um, how is it changing through space as it moves away from the sun? Essentially, it is a ballistic flight. And uh, so once you um, um, act on that sail craft by solar radiation pressure, the most of the effect from the solar radiation pressure will you will get by the orbit of Mars. After that, the solar brightness diminishes, so you don't get much. So essentially, right. you basically... Uh, blow with the significant radiation uh, uh, pressure on the sailcraft. And after that, it moves not with constant velocity. It's slightly changing. We, we're talking about V infinity. So velocity at infinity. It's slightly yeah. sl slightly diminishing, but not that much. Okay. It will be, by the time we reach the solar gravitational lens focal region, it will be moving, let's say, uh, it will be moving at 90% of the velocity that we were able to achieve uh, uh, by, by the time we reach Mars. So okay. it will be still moving very fast. Okay, so it's not going to speed up very fast once it's it's sent into its route and then slowly diminish. It's going to kind of move through space until we tell it to stop. Uh, we will not be stopping. It will just continue moving because yeah. for the solar gravitational lens, the solar gravitational lens, it's a uh, it's doesn't have a focal point. It has a focal line, and so we need to move along that focal line, and so we'll be able to image exoplanet. We don't need to stop. We just move along that focal line or an image in that exoplanet or, uh, right. as, as you move. Okay, well, let's jump into um, gravitational lensing and imaging exoplanets, which you have a lot of experience of. Um, let, how, how far have we come with that technology and where are we at currently? Yes, uh, uh, um, with a solar gravitational lensing, I think, look, uh, let, let's, let's take a step back. Uh, for example, if I want to image our own Earth, yeah. with just one pixel and uh, if that uh, if that planet will be at 100 light years away from us so it's uh, it's it's still a very close uh, proximity from the solar system so to image that object our earth at 100 light years away from us mm -hmm. with just one pixel if i want to image that object with just one pixel i need to have access to a telescope with a diameter of roughly 90 kilometers mm -hmm. Imagine it just one pixel correspond to 90 kilometers. If yeah. I want to make, if I want to make 100 pixels uh, image, 100 by 100 pixels image, I need to increase that 90 kilometers figure by 100 times. Yeah. So that's reality, just is a sobering reality that, uh, of course, astronomers would love to get uh, the uh, as, uh, the telescope as large as possible. So we're always looking for the largest telescope possible. Yeah. But reality is that there is some limit how big the telescope might be. Right. And so, as you are aware, on the ground, uh, we are now completing the telescope in Chile. It's a European large telescope, ELT. And so the diameter of the telescope is 39 meters. On Hawaii, we are building another telescope, 30 meter telescope. And so that's the, the, that is as big as we can do today. So for 30, -ish, let's say 40 meter telescope on the ground. But in space, James Webb has the, a diameter of 6.5 meters. So James Webb, that's what we actually are able to build. If you remember that 90 kilometers figure, it's just not possible to even contemplate that we will be able with 
to build this type of uh, telescopes in the solar system because there is no technology there is actually maybe there is actually no need to do that we realize that we are pressured we are pressed very hard by the realization that something called diffraction limit if you use just uh, classical optics classical optics will put a significant uh, limit as to how big the telescope you can build and how big we can uh, how big the telescope we need to see the distant objects and this is when we start looking at something unusual which is uh, gravitational lensing and of course in the solar system the largest mass we have is the, that of the sun so the most massive body is the sun and so when the light travels nearby the uh, massive body the trajectory of that light uh, of photons is changing towards it's actually it bent toward the massive body so realistically these uh, two photons that are enveloping the sun from two opposing uh, distance from from, uh, from two, two opposing sides will converge at a point of roughly 500 astronomical, astronomical units away from us if we put a spacecraft at that focal region so we are able to get a significant uh, uh, light amplification we're talking about uh, 100 billion times uh, light is amplified and right. so with a one meter telescope which right. is moving in that region now you can image that exoplanet we just got we just discussed within about a year and you have just one telescope but if you use a smaller telescope but more working in the infrared for example we're talking about um anywhere between one micron maybe two microns where most of the exciting uh gas uh, 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 uh sort of uh, lines exist this is where you can look for oxygen nitrogen methane and so these are the gases that exhibit that are present in the sort of exist in the presence of life right if you, if you want to confirm existence of life on that object we need to look at the infrared and the infrared we just realized that sensitivity we need to achieve with, with the infrared it's uh, uh solar gravitational lens provide us with very unique sensitivities 40 centimeter telescope will be able to reach signal to noise ratio of one of uh, i'm sorry of um of, of 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 four in one second 40 mm. centimeters so we don't need, really need to fly one meter telescope just a bunch of smaller telescopes and so we realize that solar gravitational lens provide us with unique capabilities to image exoplanet and also study its spectra and yep. to confirm existence of life on that object yep. so technology now we are asking about technology uh we now are able to um uh, we, we, we fully understand what is needed to uh, what type of instruments do we need to fly how do we need to operate those uh, spacecraft and instruments in the focal region yeah. so the three most interesting technology challenges first one first of those uh, challenges of course propulsion and so we realize the chemical propulsion is um, not good enough with chemical propulsion we probably will be able to reach velocities even with starship with roughly 15 AU per year. It will take a long time to get the solar uh, to, to, to the focal region of the SGL. Right. With the solar sailing, we can reach those uh, distances much faster because we can essentially we we can fly twice faster the yeah. chemical propulsion. So technology, we think once we start flying TDM, once we start flying our missions, solar sail driven missions in the solar system, the next step, the natural step, will be flight to the solar gravitational lens. The, th the second technology that we need to have, of course, uh, autonomous power, because as we move far further from the sun, solar energy may not be used as a as a, as a source of energy. We need to have uh, autonomous energy sources, and for that, there is a lot of development now in something we call radio radioisotope thermal generators. So okay. that we're using a different. Uh, we used to fly on Pioneer, for example. We used to fly uh, sort of uh, um, uh, sort of. Uh, um, uh, uranium 238 isotope and uranium 238 isotope which uh, would uh, which is radioactive and essentially provides a lot of heat and with the thermal couple you you actually develop you, you can actually have uh, electrical uh energy on board so really? with okay. flying, uh, all of the distant spacecraft needs independent energy so if you're flying beyond the orbit of jupiter you need to have autonomous energy sources and usually this is where you use radioisotope thermal generators and so, so you're utilizing uranium as it decays and that's giving off energy and that's what a radioactive decay provides you with a lot of heat yeah because, uh, it's a uh, heat is there and so now you can if you are able to contain that heat and actually use something called thermocouple effect where you you convert thermal energy into electrical energy and that's how you actually power your onboard systems 
And uh, so with this, uh, for example, we have flown most of a lot of missions, uh, all of the missions that we discussed that were flown beyond the orbit of Jupiter would use one way or another those radioisotope thermal generators. Got and it. the current rover on Mars, we have flown rovers on Mars, uh, starting with uh, uh, Sojourner, then Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, so those rovers would have solar solar panels. And solar panels, you need to charge, you need to use solar panels, uh, yeah. charge those batteries on board, and it takes some time. They're very effective. But the current rover on Mars, uh, Perseverance, has uh, radioisotope thermal generators. You mm -hmm. don't need to wait for sun to rise on the, on the surface of Mars. You can operate through the night. Okay. because you have an autonomous uh, power moving uh, away from the sun this is where you need to have lightweight right. and the uh, very sort of continuous force that will be able to provide you with autonomous power and so that's what is being developed uh, developed now so lightweight sources are, are being developed by m multiple organizations we expect that when within about five to seven years we'll have uh, several options for those uh, our RHUs, radioisotope heating units, that we can fly on our sailcraft. And those uh, radioisotope heating units, uh, the thermal uh, thermal units, uh, RHUs, radioisotope heating units, they will be able to uh, essentially charge the battery and enable the science operations of the spacecraft. So that's the second technology. The third technology, of course, is communication. So you need to bring the data back. And so we are studying optical communications for that. We actually, if you, um, uh, you, you, I'm sure you're aware that recently we have uh, received a very nice uh, message from a Psyche mission uh, where DSOC, Deep Space Optical Communication Terminal, uh, brought us the movie of a cat that uh, uh, that was filmed on Earth, and essentially that movie was brought back in optical using optical communication capability. It's a high data rate ca capability, and so now optical communication is demonstrated from deep space. Now we can use not microwaves, but optical comb. Right. And for the slow gravitational lens, once we have the telescope, the imaging telescope, the same telescope may be used to drive the uh, laser signal on board to essentially enable a code in, in, encode that laser signal. So it will be able to transmit and receive uh, signals between spacecraft and the ground base station. And on the ground, we can use one of the 10 meter telescopes that exist now. So there are all of the key technologies are either in existent, existence or being actively developed. So sales are being developed in multiple organizations. Radioisotope thermal units, as we discussed, they're also being developed also in multiple organizations because there is a lot of demand on those uh, units. Yep. And communication is being demonstrated. And uh, now a lot of commercial companies that are building business to provide optical communication from low Earth orbit and from deep space. So yep. step by step, all of the technologies that are needed to fly a spacecraft to solar gravitational lens focal region are yeah. being developed and that's very nice development and the focal region is is far enough away from the actual sun where the energy from the sun cannot be used to power it so we need so everything's kind of lining up and can you touch more on the optical um on the communication piece how is that why is that needed is it just so far away that something new is needed or Optical communication, <clears throat> optical communication is important because again, we're talking about a uh, really diffraction limit. If you use an, any any antenna, any telescope, let's say radio telescope or optical telescope, you have a beam divergence. So it's a beam divergence. It's a it's a property of your of your instrument, and so that uh, it's it's a ratio of lambda over d, where lambda is a wavelength that you use. Like it will be three centimeters for microwave, ten centimeters. And divided by the diameter of uh, the telescope you use. If it's a radio telescope, you have uh, three centimeters divided by, by, say, by two meters. And so this is how your radiation that you emit will diverge as, as it move, moves away from the, uh, from the transmitter. By the time it reaches your receiver, uh, your receiver is much smaller in size, right? And basically, in this case, you are receiving only a small fraction of the energy that you transmitted okay and so for lambda uh, for optical wavelength now you you we are talking not about centimeters but microns mm. so the beam divergence is much smaller right and so you get a more collimated beam and so essentially yes there will be some uh we call space loss as the signal propagates through large distances and this divergence actually lead to the fact that the footprint of the signal that on, at, at, the trans, at the receiver will be still large. 
but you will get a much higher power density uh, at, the, at the receiver. And yeah. essentially, you, can, you, you know, with the lasers that we have from uh, photonics, from the fiber optics, uh, we have a very nice lasers that are stable, that can be flown in space. You can pump more energy in that signal. So not only do you have a smaller beam divergence, but you can actually use more collimated beam and essentially pump more energy into that beam. So you actually will be able to transmit more energy and more energy will be reach, uh, will be reaching your receiver. In this case, optical communication will enable to uh, will, will enable us to have uh, HDTV quality video from Mars, for example. Okay. When astronauts fly into Mars or to the moon, essentially you will have uh, you know, sort of the camera on a helmet camera and helmet camera will be transmitting first to ground to the lunar base. And then from lunar base, we can send the signal almost immediately back to Earth. Right. And with some small delay, we'll see what is uh, what astronauts are seeing in front of them. Yeah. And for that, we need to have uh, this uh, high data rate communication, which is optical communication, not microwave. Right. Okay. Let's talk about kind of what we're looking for if we do get to the S, um, the um, this gel mm -hmm. point. Um, if we're able to get a craft there, are we looking at the surface correlated spect um, spectroscopy of the elements? Or are we actually looking at um, images or both? What, what's going to tell you in your ideal world like that there's life on this planet? Taylor, all of the above, but let us let us the question in a different way. Okay. Why would why would we want to fly something like this? What what are the benefits of this? Uh, who cares about image? Image is wonderful, but many many skeptics will say, okay, image is okay, but what do we learn? So why do we need to invest time and uh, money to fly a mission like this? And to me, I think imaging is not enough. Yes, definitely, this will be the first time humanity will see the image of uh, a distant exoplanet or a planet in our neighborhood, let's say Proxima B or, ta or sort of uh, um, uh, other, other um, Trappist, uh, other systems that we discovered. We'll be able for the first time to see those exoplanets, but we will immediately want more. And so what do we want? We want to have uh, confirmation that this planet has, has, uh, has life in it. And to do that, we need to observe the textile planet not in the optical wavelength, but in the infrared. So infrared were the most interesting spectrum, uh, spectral lines. As I mentioned, oxygen, nitrogen, methane. And so a certain combination of those lines will indicate on the on, ongoing organic processes on that exoplanet. So now, if that exoplanet has a very strong emission of methane from, from, from some area, we know that there is a swamp on that on that that exoplanet, and that swamp emits uh, lots of methane. Or if there is some uh, you know some uh, uh, cities on that exoplanet, because we will be able to see with optical, we will see continental lines, weather patterns, topography. We will see with optical, but really to confirm ongoing activity, maybe industrial activity, maybe organic sort of a life activity, we need to have a different uh, different uh, observable. And that observable will be infrared spectroscopy. And so we can, uh, with infrared spectroscopy, we'll be able to uh, correlate sort of the, uh, the, it will correlate the spectroscopic data with the spatial data on the imaging. We will be able to correlate that indeed this this is the city. There is emission of uh, different you know, industrial activity from that city, and so that will be something that we'll we will be able to see for the first time. And then that's something not only we will be able to confirm life that exists outside the solar system. Let's go beyond that initial shock. That yes, not shock, but in, in initial joy that we are not alone in the universe. What's next? And the next is studying that life remotely, studying how do they live? How do they treat the environment? Do they waste the environment as ineffectively as we do? Uh, right. Studying using uh, you know, carbon fuel, that do we damage our environment? Can we learn something from them? Or can we tell something for, for them? Because we will be able eventually communicate with them. But um, the first step would be to really confirm, not to observe and get some static picture, but to confirm the life that it used to be what if the planet is about 20 light years away we'll be able to confirm that 20 20 20 years ago that planet had the, those conditions right because well when we look in the universe we see the past we don't see the present we don't see the future we can only predict the future because it takes for light to take some time to reach our telescope so we know that for 20 years ago on that exoplanet there was something like this yeah it is exciting that's what we're looking for can we can we aim SGL 
at other focal points that a star has to at see other targets absolutely see if life other life has used that focal point for their own means uh, see there are two questions in, in what you're asking one question is um solar uh, the, the the mission that will be flying to sgl mm -hmm. it will um if before before flying that mission we will need to understand what target do you want to observe right and uh, because now we have a, we were able to discover almost ten thousand exoplanets, mm -hmm. and I expect within the next I would say five to ten years the this number will be maybe increased by five maybe by ten times. Yeah. At some point we'll start uh, seeing planets similar to our own planet, but we will be never we will, we will we will never be able to see surfaces of those exoplanets, because the techniques that we are using uh, will tell us only. There is some atmospheric disturbance. There's something interesting on that uh, atmosphere of that exoplanet that's consistent with ongoing life. SGL will be our first step to see them. Now, once we select a, a handful of those interesting targets, we need to fly with our technology today. If we use solar sails, we will be uh, able to fly a mission towards a particular stellar system, to a particular host star that has that exoplanet and other its sister planets. So when we fly a mission to Saturn or to Jupiter, we observe not just those planets, but the entire satellite system. So think about a single mission to along the single focal line. We'll be able to see not just that exoplanet, but it's the planet that planets that orbit in the same host star. A different host star will need to have a different mission because with the technology that we have today, it will be very hard to repoint our telescope, big telescope, to a different stellar system because we need to move laterally. And so with the technology that we have, with solar sailing and the electric propulsion, it will be just not enough. So our objective is to make the mission very affordable, meaning it will be affordable in a, in a, in, in, in the sense of it will be, uh, we can fly not one, but several uh, missions to several uh, focal lines of uh, corresponding to most promising uh, targets. And uh, but even one of them would be would be amazing. So yeah. uh, next next step in technology, once we have something, maybe nuclear propulsion, maybe some some next level of propulsion where we can maneuver, that will be the for the next technology level, the layer where we'll be able to reposition our uh, spacecraft, which is uh, somewhere a distance of 650 astronomical units away from the sun, reposition it to look at the different target. But for now, with technology that we have, we will be happy. If you fly one or two or three uh, missions uh, towards the focal lines corresponding to the targets that we expect will have life. And so that's how we see it. And and I'm assuming we can, we have the ability to look at the focal lines of other stars where yep. they might have their own SGLs. So we can, so that would be beneficial to see if this is truly the the way that people, people, um, life searches for other life. Maybe not, but um, that's just uh, There may be other interesting ways for us to explore that. For example, once we are at the focal region of the solar gravitational lens, we will be able to receive signals. If uh, somebody out there transmits a signal towards our sun, so we will be able to receive a highly amplified signal from uh, those aliens or whatever extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial activity is out there. So we will, we will be able to receive optical or microwave signals from a particular system. And uh, that's one thing. So it's for interstellar communication purposes. We can use gravitational lensing, in our case, solar gravitational lensing, to amplify light, to amplify, amplify signals, so that we'll be able to uh, establish maybe two-way communication link with the other uh, with the other uh, civilization that is possible because gravitational lensing allows us to establish two-way communication but for example if we if we have only for example if you have a uh, interstellar spacecraft and interstellar spacecraft may be able to transmit from a uh, gravitational uh, lens uh, of a nearby star towards our sun towards yeah. our stellar uh, stellar lens and then there will be two-way communication between two lenses but we don't have to do that. Uh, spacecraft, interstellar spacecraft traveling somewhere in the, in the galaxy can transmit directly towards our sun. And if we have a spacecraft at the focal region of our sun, then 
solar gravity will magnify that, uh, will amplify that light, uh, that signal, and we'll be able to receive that message from the interstellar spacecraft as well. I so see. we looked recently on this establishing two-way communication link. In, indeed, gravitational lens and allows us to do that. Wow, understood. So not only look, but receive signals from different um, uh, kind of communication method as well. Um, exactly. So gravitational lensing may be used in multiple ways. We yeah. looked at the way of using as a uh, uh, gravitational lensing as a telescope, mm -hmm. seeing distant uh, distant targets. Mm -hmm. But uh, because uh, we use light to study the universe, that light may be formed by either astrophysical phenomena or industrial activities. Right. With industrial activities, there may be some uh, telescope and transmitter that will transmit into the solar gravitational lens from a very large distance. And if you have a spacecraft out there, we can receive that signal and essentially, you know, communicate uh, two way, commun establish a two way communication. Yeah. Well, we talked a little bit about it, but um, I'd love to talk about private industry and its impact on maybe the next 25 years and kind of your work. Um, do you, see, I, I know the answer, but did you see kind of private industry as an accelerant to? what has traditionally been governmental um, ran projects that has shown us the in innovations in space. Um, I'm, assu I'm assuming, I kind of know your answer, but go ahead. Look, for the last 20 years, uh, since 2003, I would say, uh, we started, uh, we, we observed a significant growth in private industry, in space industry. and. Um, uh it's uh, it all started essentially uh when uh, uh, spacex demonstrated the capability that you can actually reduce the cost of accessing uh sp space access and developing right. their capabilities they went uh, through a lot of interesting uh, um, restraints and they were able to break through some of them and they were able to reduce the cost of accessing uh, space access to space significantly and uh, mid 90s uh, the cost of bringing one kilogram of uh, 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 payload to a low Earth orbit was about forty-three thousand dollars. Uh, well, uh, forty-three thousand dollars per one kilogram. Mm -hmm. Today, you can have about uh, seven hundred uh, fifty to eight hundred dollars per kilogram. Mm -hmm. So that's the change uh, in terms of uh, uh, how much does it cost to bring that uh, one kilogram to low Earth orbit. We expect with the Starship uh, when Starship will fly the cost will reduce further. We're talking about maybe $150, $180 per kilogram. Mm -hmm. And so think about this. Uh, before, you should um, allocate significant amount of money to develop any mission to space. And usually, because of that uh, cost, it's only government who can do something like this. And so it's only government who were able to fly uh, missions in, uh, in around Earth and to the moon. But now, with the cost significantly reduced, plus a very uh, interesting impact of the internet industry, uh, robotics, uh, photonics, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting synergistic development, a spacecraft that used to weigh about 500 to 700 kilograms, now a spacecraft with the same capabilities will weigh somewhere about 50 kilograms. And so now you can launch uh, on one launch vehicle, not one spacecraft, but at least 16 of them. And right. we know the record was established by an uh, Indian uh, launch uh, vehicle. So when they launched about 140 spacecraft in space, we're talking about small CubeSat class missions. So they're not yet capable, fully capable. It's a, they, they're used now for technology development to develop some, some interesting capabilities. But uh, through the years, uh, something is interesting. Uh, some standard is being developed now. We call it ESPA class uh, missions, ESPA class spacecraft. Okay. Uh, expandable uh, sort of uh, um, uh, ring uh, ad ad adapter, and yep. uh, you you can put uh, up to uh, five to eight uh, spacecraft, with, which would weigh anywhere between sixty to maybe one hundred twenty kilograms, and mm -hmm. you can launch them in one launch vehicle. So now the cost of the launch vehicle, not only the cost reduced significantly, but now even the access into access to space for a million dollars that I can fly my spacecraft, which which uh, used to cost. In the past, if I would if I would buy Delta II launch, it would cost me 120 million. So mm -hmm. now I had to buy the whole vehicle back then. 
So because uh, there, there was no idea to fly two spacecraft, it was very difficult and uh, not very uh, sort of uh, supported. Now right. I can fly, I can be one of the spacecraft, and, the, and my cost would be anywhere from a million if I'm uh, flying as a co-shared uh, payload, or I can uh, if, if if I'm the most important spacecraft on that uh, vehicle, I will buy part of it. So it will not be hundreds of millions of dollars. I will, for a reasonable cost, I can fly a small spacecraft to lower Earth, low Earth orbit. So for me, as a private industry, that uh, that, um, that uh, sort of uh, uh, economical barrier is now reduced significantly. I can start developing new business models, and you can see how the for the last I would say ten years how much investment went into private industry, and how many uh, companies being born. We're talking about companies that uh, use technologies that used to be in the domain of you know government only. So something called synthetic aperture radar. A synthetic, a synthetic aperture radar, when I joined JPL, we started developing these technologies and have flown them on, on a shuttle to demonstrate that microwave signals can be bounced off the, off the Earth and received back on the spacecraft. And essentially, you can provide very high resolution of the Earth surface, independent on weather, because these microwave signals can go through clouds uh, day and night. Uh, it's no, no problem, sort of 24-7 operations. And uh, back then, uh, there was not a business case for that. Now there are successful companies such as ISI in Finland that actually develops a cons develop the constellation of small spacecraft that are very inexpensive, that they can actually use synthetic aperture capability to monitor activities on the ground. Everywhere on the planet, you can get 24-7 information uh, pretty much independent of any weather, and you can get a lot of that information. You can track the shipments of different, you know, uh, um, uh, goods and you can track all the activities in uh, any any point on the planet or now we can talk about optical communication as you're aware there is uh, some optical communication signals between uh, some of the spacecraft that starlink is flying so the next step will be to land that signal to the ground so right. once you have fully optical signals between ground-based uh, terminal to this uh, instruments in, in in space now you can have uh, Data transmission capabilities between uh, uh, sort of people on the be, between people and business on, on, on Earth will be much improved. So that's a lot of examples how interesting technologies are being developed. Observation, spectroscopy, we monitor our activities, we monitor global warming, the, the health of the planet, and that that is due to private industry. A lot of private industry now stepping in, helping us to learn more about the, our planet. In addition to private industry, some a theme that I'm seeing that is going to kind of probably be really important is robotics as well. I personally don't see a human needing to go to space in maybe 30 years from now. I, I think, you know, we might be able to put robots up there instead um, that don't need to be alive and fed and um, breathe to do the things that they're doing so um i know we are going to have a new space um international space station soon correct so um do you envision that kind of being a theme as well robotics kind of taking over and and men and man will be in the um in space anymore or do you think we'll still need um astronauts and cosmonauts look i want to go to space i'm gonna fly Right. I'm interested. I will go there as an as a tourist. I will go there to see to experience life on this planet, to see the planet from space. I want to travel. I want to go to the moon. So that is something my interest, my curiosity. Is there a business necessity for that? Not yet. And so there is a commercial need to go to uh, for for people to go beyond the low Earth orbit. Not yet. At some point, maybe. And so as as we explore solar system most of our exploration done by robots and you're right we don't want to risk uh, human life to send people to a risky environment let's say some uh, europa enceladus we can do this with robots and we will continue to do that but human presence will be slowly uh, more and more acceptable in uh, different environments for now i think the uh, going to space suborbital flights people have a number of people have flown on suborbital flights that is something people will be doing it's interesting it's safe it's getting safer and so we'll be flying experiencing that uh excitement of seeing planet uh from from space many people go to everest many people go to you know uh, 
uh, uh, very expensive vacations. They spend money to do some, so some something for themselves. Space will right. be one of those activities. Right. So um, space tourism will be a thing, but mainly kind of like when we go to Mars, I don't think we need to go to Mars, basically. Until uh, space tourism is, is way after all the science has been done, I guess is what I'm kind of getting at. Look, if we can go to Mars and can bring people back safely, we will do right. it. So right. for now, we have explored Mars and uh, robots are exploring Mars and definitely we would like to explore more. Yeah. But if we have the technology and if the technology is available, why not go in? Right. So it's it's all um, it all how much we can actually uh, what is the objective to set a colony on Mars? I, do, I just don't get it. It's yeah. not it's not something that, that, that I think it's uh, critical for us. Right. But really, if we are safe, if we can bring people safely back home, yeah. maybe it's the first step. And so if you're able to populate those planets at some point in the future, wonderful, let's be it. But right. it's not the same as it used to be when Polynesians explored uh, Pacific Ocean. When they started from New Zealand all the way to Polynesia, then they reached Hawaii, traveling and sort of there was economical benefit for them and right. sort of so, so, so survival. They would be using uh, their ships, uh, so sailors, uh, so, so. they would be sailing between the islands, but there would be uh, there would be something for them to um, sort of to move in the ocean to right. explore to bring right mm, it's not like that for us it's not, not really. like that because not really if it would be another earth instead of mars so two habitable exoplanets yeah. then definitely you can go between one planet to another yeah. but uh mars is not is it's not in this category so right. it's not it's not we are not there yet but traveling people will travel people uh, travel to low Earth orbit. People will travel um, definitely, and so space station. Maybe some uh, scientists will fly if mm -hmm. they be inexpensive, relatively inexpensive, flying to the new space station that will be built maybe in the ten years time. So then flying there and conducting some experiments in microgravity, maybe it will be reasonable. For now, it's just too expensive, and so many of those experiments that uh, that are done in space can be done can still be done by robots we can fly sort of robotic spacecraft and essentially uh study uh different processes biology chemistry uh building things but i fully agree with you robotics is a very important thing and so more robotics uh, actually working together with the large language models with the sort of uh, artificial intelligence so that's a combination that very interesting because once you get um a lot of data so now we receive a lot of data from spacecraft uh, orbiting Earth. It's like we are drinking out of the fire hose. Yeah. So a lot of data and getting a little piece of data, it's not enough. So artificial 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 intelligence will help us to get uh, more insight as to what is happening on our planet. And so that's where the robotics and artificial intelligence onboard processing will help us to learn more about ourselves. Right. Yeah, I think I think soon, maybe in ten years, fifteen years, we'll have um, humanoid robots who can one to one. Um, there'll be like no delta. It'll be like the movement that it can make will be the same thing as a normal six foot man or, or woman who's doing this in space. So that's why I was thinking. It's like, do we need to even send them? But I, I agree with the I agree with the curiosity aspect and the tourism aspect. We'll, we'll definitely need to do that for sure. Um, but big question now. Um, do you think? based off of where you're at and because you're kind of at the forefront of this in um in your lifetime we will um find signs of life outside of earth absolutely i think enceladus will be the first one okay and, um, and hopefully within the next i would say uh 20 years we will be able to have a, a handful of uh, uh exoplanets that exhibit uh not only atmosphere but oxygen rich atmospheres and okay. so then basically there will be some disturbances in the atmospheres indicating the presence of life yeah and so for me uh to confirm that indeed that, that this is uh, a life bearing exoplanet we need to fly uh, we, we need to fly the solar gravitational lens mission right and so my, my objective is that within the next 30 35 years we should be able to see uh surface and to, uh, of exoplanet and confirm existence of that life i fully believe that, that this this will happen right yeah well i really hope you're part of that and um that would be super exciting. Um, Absolutely, that's what drives me. 
yeah, I think I think probably in my life and in, in, in your life, I hope I hope you're part of that. Um, and then why don't we end on the next phases of um, solar sales and kind of where your research and, and focus lies right now and what's to come maybe in the next mm -hmm. six months to a year. Excellent. With solar sails, now we are studying solar sails for exploring the moon. Uh, it's uh, in this lunar environment. Solar sails will offer very interesting capabilities that will allow us to do something that we call pole seaters. Uh, 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 solar sails may be used to sort of uh, hover uh, around the south pole of the moon. Uh, yeah. That means we call it pole seater, a very ha ha halo orbit around around uh, sort of uh, in, in some region. And so it will be used for communication purposes, will be able, uh, able to actually to explore the moon. So that's one of the first steps. Okay. I think within the next, I would say, uh, three, four years, we will see uh, those spacecraft around the moon. Uh, within about uh, two years, we will see spacecraft, a uh, sailcraft uh, going around around the sun. So with, within about five to seven years, I think we will see a mission orbiting the sun. And so that will be a solar a solar polar imager. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I want to see a mission uh, within the same time frame that will be able to use, to observe, to look at the Earth as, a, as an exoplanet. For that, uh, we need to move away from, uh, from Earth uh, pretty much about uh, 20 lunar distances. And then we see how the Earth will be transiting the sun. Mm. And so use the same technologies that we use to study transiting exoplanets. And the question is, can we confirm the presence of life on our planet using our understanding how transits are happening? Right. So with whatever technology we, we, we deploy here. And that will be, you know, we'll have co co uh, comparative data. We can look at Mercury, we can look at Venus, and we can look at Earth. Yeah. Can, we, can we confirm life on, on the Earth? Right. And how can we, how should we be able to tune the technologies that we developed to study life uh, on another, another exoplanet? And that can be done only again with the solar sails because you need to actually slightly adjust the trajectory of your spacecraft so that the transit will happen at an appropriate uh, transit, the Earth transit will happen at an appropriate time through the disk of the sun. Right. And so that's the uh, three uh, three missions that I would like to see within the next five to seven years. Solar gravitational lens proper mission. Uh, by, by that time, we would like to actually already be de developing some technologies for, for that mission and flying SGL by 2035. Mm -hmm. So that will be, uh, we will fly several spacecraft, several constellations of spacecraft uh, towards different targets. Yep. And uh, it will take about 20 years for those sailcraft to reach uh, solar gravitational lens focal region. And at that time, uh, by the time probably in about what, uh, 2050, uh, 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 so uh, at that time we will be approaching uh, the focal region of the SGL. There will be a lot of interesting uh, things to work on the mission and so, sort of getting ready before the first image will be of the exoplanet will be delivered. Yep. So for the next 30 years, I plan, plan to be busy. Thanks. So funding's all lined up and everything kind of is, is certain in that regard too? Or Funding is an exciting topic. Funding will be always an objective because yeah. uh, we need to, uh, uh, it, 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 these activities will always require funding. So yeah. basically, um, it's, it's not a commercial activity. In this case, it will be, uh, we, we are ongoing for uh, a process of fundraising. We bring in money for the first for the TDM. As we successfully we'll start bringing money to the first mission and mm -hmm. working with our, our, our colleagues and partners at NASA, uh, at uh, other mm -hmm. space agencies, with the private industry, with the uh, equity, for equity funds, so sort of the of, of foundations. We will be working with a number of those organizations to bring in uh, initial funding. Yeah. And so that is, that, that is an exciting goal that we would like to achieve.